Speaking at the opening of the party's national conference held in Ulundi last night, the party secretary general, Venen Kosini Hlabisa, is a tip to succeed Butelezi. Prince Butelezi believes the incoming leadership will be able to grow the IFP. My story will be very short. On March the 21st, 1975, a group of patriots gathered in Kwanzimela in Melmo to reignite political mobilization. Thus, in Katen Kulewe Caesar was born. English, in English, it was the National Cultural Liberation Movement. Fifteen years later, on July 14, 1990, a conference of Inkata was convened here in Urundi to celebrate the unbanning of political organizations. On that day, we became Inkata Freedom Party. Over the past four decades, our structures have met in gatherings like this. We have come together comrades to consider the battle confronting our country and to sharpen our weapons of warfare. In conferences like this, we have elected leaders, adopted policies, debated issues, opened our hearts and reached consensus. We have chosen the path of moral integrity and confirmed it again and again. Out of conferences like this, unity has emerged, securing the IFP survival in a turbulent political sea. Strategies have been found not only to make our voices heard, but to speak with the voice of truth. We have pursued the best interests of our country, and we have committed to serve. It is in conferences like this, comrades, that watershed moments have been marked. Now we gather to for another watershed moment. This weekend, the rank and file of the IFP will elect a president, a deputy president, a national chairperson, a deputy national chairperson, a secretary general, and deputy secretary general as well as 34 committee members who will serve on our National Council. Now, this is nothing unusual, for we've done this in elective conference for many years in the past, 44 years. But this conference is different. It was accompanied by unprecedented hype and speculation. Because this conference, in this conference, Butelezi will step down. All right, that was uh, Prince Mangasutu Butelezi earlier on. We understand that he's currently speaking at the elective conference in Ulundi, KwaZulu Natal. So let's bring you that live. Voila. The Reverend PGS Dombela, who Led our devotions, Emeritus Canon of the Cathedral of St. Michael and All Angels. Nabesilo, Makosi Sendum Ulu, Nkosi Menziwa, Nkosi Rachabisa. I'm going to go to the Kulu and go to the Tuli. I'm going to go to the Shabalala. I'm going to go the Deputy President of the party. I'm going to go to the The Deputy Chairperson of the IFP, His Worship, Mr. Albert Mnwango, the 
the chairperson of the Women's Brigade, Don Pumzile, the chairperson of the Youth Brigade, the Honorable Mr. Mumalo, the Treasurer General of our party, the Honorable Mr. Singh, the Deputy Treasurer General, I'm sorry, Treasurer General of the, our party, the Honorable Mr. Sabisa, the Deputy uh, Brother, I'm sorry, Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General, Professor Simon, members of the National Council, members of the NEC, members of the National Council and members of the NEC, our distinguished guests, Mr. Malinga of NATO has just addressed us. Mr. Arthur Konekrama, chairperson of Amanda Mata and Ilana, who is here. And our founding general secretary for administration, Mr. MZ Kumalo. Honorable members of parliament, honorable members of legislatures present, their worships, our mayors, our councillors, Induna, Zamakose, Ikona, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> to summarize what I have to say, a lifetime will never be enough, actually, to serve a country, especially a country I love so much. I rise today not to deliver the usual speech, must make that very clear from the beginning, but to close an era. To do that properly, I'm obliged to speak on the history of our liberation struggle. That's what I delivered today is a lesson in history, as much as a call to the future. I plead for your patience as I speak about the past. It weighs heavily on my mind that this will be the last time I address a national conference of the Inkara Freedom Party as your president. I realize that what I say here today will remember when I'm long gone as my final words. But somehow that doesn't dampen my spirit. I'm excited to hand over the baton to the next generation of leaders. I have confidence that we have done everything possible to secure a smooth transition into the next chapter of the IFP. This party is standing in a place of strength. There has been a resurgence in support and a growth in membership that speaks of the IFP's continued value in the politics of South Africa and in the hearts of the people. Now is the time, and we are ready. We are entering a new season. This new season for the IFP coincides with a season in our country. And I'm not talking about the so-called new dawn, but about the season of struggle that has opened in South Africa, a new struggle. After a quarter of a century of freedom, we have moved into a new struggle that will take the same depth and consistency of commitment that our past struggle for freedom demanded. The liberation struggle that my generation waged is over. The struggle of this generation is for social and economic justice. Yet, our greatest weapon from the struggle of the past is still our greatest weapon now. That is something we need to understand. It was our belief in democratic ideals that sustained us through the onslaught of political oppression and discrimination and hatred. 
It was the triumph of democratic ideals that brought this country to the threshold of change and delivered safely into freedom. I believe with utter conviction that the struggle for social and economic justice will be won on the strength of democratic ideals. It is these ideals, my compatriots, that have the power to transform us again from a nation of economic crisis to a nation of economic strength, from a nation of inequality to a nation of justice. There is however a very real threat to democratic ideals. As much as these ideals had enemies in our liberation struggle, they have enemies now in the struggle for justice. It seems absurd after all we have done to entrench democracy. But there is a threat. It took root quietly in the dark, in the fertile soil of anger, dissatisfaction, and our hope deferred. Out of that soil, a threat has grown, it has grown up, and has matured into a call for revolution. Not the revolution of goodwill, that we long desired, but a revolution of destruction to tear down every symbol of discontent, regardless of any damage that may do to the economy, to social cohesion, or our shared future. In the midst of the impending threat, and faced with the struggle for justice, the IP carries a very unique destiny. We have within us the DNA of unity, of integrity, and truth. Over 44 years, the IP has established a legacy. We have been consistently the champion of democratic ideals. Throughout the liberty struggle, no matter the twists and turns, it took Nkata, Nkata remained true to its mission. That, my fellow South African, is our legacy. And it's this legacy, that legacy that we must bring to bear as we engage this new season of struggle. We must be once again the champion of democratic ideals where others abandon the ideals of democracy and adopt new ideologies of division, autocracy, and self-enrichment, the IFP must stay the cause, speaking with the voice of reason, and calling our nation back to democracy. But before I talk to you about the struggle ahead, let me speak about where we come from. And now we came to be where we are now. This history is important because it equips us with a proper understanding of South Africa and of the IFP's destiny. From the 7th, 17th century, since the 17th century, people came from abroad and saw this country admiring its beauty. They decided to dispossess us of our land. This was done through wars that they waged against our people. From the Cape to what is today East Africa and what is called today West Africa. There were so-called Kefir Wars in the Cape, waged purely to dispossess us of our land. There was the Anglo Zulu War here, which while historians like to designate as a Zulu, a Zulu War, there were wars in other parts of the country, such as the war against the Pedi people, in which King Sikukuni distinguished himself so much as a man of great valor that he earned the admiration of my maternal great-grandfather, King Tejoyo Gampan. King Tejoyo actually sent some gold sovereigns to King Sikukuni in what is in the today to support his resistance to black dispossession of land by invaders. I must go into detail about what happened in every part of our land because after British invasion, we all finally became the vanquished. 
and the landless. In this part of the country, King Tejuayo, after he was exiled to the Cape, requested to meet with the British monarch, Her Majesty Queen Victoria, and was hoping to return to his kingdom. Unfortunately, the terms of which he returned were quite unacceptable because Lord Kimberley, who was then the Secretary for Colony, British Colonies, had divided the kingdom into 13 parts, and the king's nobles were encouraged not to regard him as their sovereign anymore. This, of course, led to civil wars between the Zulu people themselves. Then the Joyo's son, King Tinuzulu, suffered the same fate as his, as his father and ended up exiled on the island of St. Helena. King Solomon Gatinzulu was born on the island of St. Helena, as were his siblings, Prince Mshieni Gatinzulu, Prince Nyawana Gatinzulu, Prince Mkwashu Gatinzulu, and Prince Pegalendo Gatinzulu. My mother, Princess Makoko, was born at your suit to royal residence after the king's return. Well, at the end of the civil wars, most of our best land was taken over by white South Africa. The king and Amakosi remained literally perched like birds on the bits and pieces on which they were residing. Many of our people were removed from most of their ancestral land. In a book, the title of which is Kefas Alively, written by a journalist who worked for the Star about 40 years ago, by the name of Oliver Walker, described the land that remained in our hands as very beautiful rockeries. He said even a baboon would need crutches to walk on it. <laughs> Just a few years after King Tunis would return from St. Helena, in Kospambata Gamangiza of the Zondi clan in Great Town District, started what is often described in history book as the Pambata Rebellion of 1906. After starting the, the red resistance, Inkos Pambata then took his wife, Usiegi Zondu Mazuma, and his daughter Ukolegil to King Tinzulu's royal residence at Osutu. My mother, Princess Makoko Tinzulu, often told us how, how with other king's children they played with Kolegil at Osutu royal residence. Inkos Pambata's wife, Mazuma Usiegi, then went to the magistrate here at Masabatin to tell the magistrate that she and her daughter had been hidden by King Tinizulu at his Osutu residence. As a result, King Tinizulu was arrested and charged with high treason in Great Town. He was convicted and jailed at the Newcastle jail. In 1910, when the English and the Afrikaners having buried the hatchet after the Anglo-Zulu, Anglo-Boer War, decided to form the, a white state in this part of the, the world called the Union of South Africa, in which we blacks were excluded. General E. Louis Porter became his first prime minister. It was only then that Prime Minister Porter released King Tunisul. However, he was not allowed to return to his home Instead, he was exiled again on the farm Eitkek, in what was then the Middleburg district of then Transvaal. It was there that King Tunisulu, in fact, died in October 1913. We suffered the same oppression after the Union from, the, from various governments of South Africa. King Solomon Gat Tunisulu succeeded his father on the throne, although officially he was called the chief of Usutu. He passed away on the 4th of March, 1983, and his younger brother, Prince Mishien Gatinizulu, succeeded him as the regent of the Zulu nation. In 1948, His Majesty King Cyprian Nyang Azizwe Beguzul Solomon was installed. First, like his father, he was designated the chief of Usut. It was during this time that the then government decided to give him the title of paramount chief of the Zulus, a title which had no legal implications. In 1951, the sovereign government, parliament, passed a law called the Bantu, 
Authorities Act of 1951. After the passing away of King Cyprian Pegusulu, Solomon, his brother, Prince Mkwezeni, Israel, Solomon, was installed as the region. Since our present king was still under age. However, he too was installed as paramount chief of the Zulu nation. Well, let me go back a little. In 1960, political activity was heating up. Robert Mangalisa Sobogwe organized a protest by the Pan Africanist Congress, which had broken away from the African National Congress. The PAC burned their dumb buses, which all of us as black people had to carry. This was done in Sharpville, in what was then to Transvaal province, as the result our people were, who were in that demonstration were shot with live ammunition by the police. Several people died. In course, Albert Dutuli, we had been officially deposed as Inkosi when he became the leader of the African National Congress. Then gave an instruction that members of the African National Congress should also burn their passes. And he started with his own, burning his own jumpers. The apartheid regime reacted sharply by burning our political movements, the African National Congress, Pan Africanist Congress, Azanian Organization, and others. Many of our leaders were placed on banning orders as well. The sovereign government actively encouraged African people all over the country on the basis of ethnicity to accept, I put accept in quotes, the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951, which was the basis of the big effort of white South Africa to dispossess black South Africans of their land. They wanted now to take the whole country. According to this arrangement, black South Africans were to be stripped of their South African citizenship, and blacks were to be foreigners in 87% of the country. We were to be citizens of the bits and pieces of land, which composed only 13%, on which we blacks remained perched like birds after they dispossessed us of the rest of our country. Here in Wazulu, we resisted longest accepting, quote unquote, the South African Bantu Tourist Act. Because the South African government were being very clever, you know, in that they, they wanted the world to be given the impression that we as black South Africans abandoned our citizenship of our own volition. So they said that the act was merely permissive and that each clan had the privilege and an option to accept it. All along I argued myself when they came to the Bertelese clan that it was not for me as in course to accept the system of governing because it's the people that will be governed and that it would make up our mind anyway when we observed how it operated in those clans that had accepted the Bantu Authorities Act. But at long last, officials were sent to address the Bitelezi clan to say that we were, quote, wrongly instructed, unquote, when it was said that we had any choice or option in the matter. This was a government law like any law. In the meantime, our leader, the President of the African National Congress, Nkos Albert Dutuli, and Mr. Oliver Tambo, had sent Mr. Klopas and Sibande to my sister in Daviton. Mr. Sibande later became the ANC's after 94. He became the interim leader of, of the ANC in Gauteng. My sister, Princess Mojina, was married to a medical, Dr. Mafu Totoana, from the Eastern Cape, who practiced in Daviton Township. In course, Albert Tutulu happened to be visiting Mr. Tambo in Watville, where Mr. Tambo's residence is situated. And this happened, of course, to be townships in Pinoni. The message that in course, Albert Tutulu and Mr. Tambo sent through Mr. Klopas and Sibande to me through my sister 
was that seeing that the Bounty Authorities Act was being forced down our throats, I should not refuse to accept leading it. If I'm a Kosi and representatives of districts, regional authorities in Guazulu requested me to lead it. They said they were instructing me to do so notwithstanding the fact that our movement, then the African National Congress, was opposed to the setting up of these homeland governments. They said they asked me to do so as they saw me as a member of the organization who would ensure that the breaking up of Zululand, these pieces and bits from South Africa, would never be achieved. It was me as a cadre of the ANC who was in charge of the Zulu government. I was a Trojan horse. Because it was the bits and pieces of land on which the king, Amakos, and their people perched like birds. In fact, when I was in charge of it, one of the reasons I gave that we would never here accept Kwazulu, those bits and pieces as a country, is that it was an archipelago. It was an archipelago of 10 non contiguous pieces. And I always compared the map of Kwazulu at that time as similar to the skin of a Dalm Dalmatian dog. Strangely, all of a sudden the southern government, without cons consulting us or the king, excised the district of Ngwavuma in 1982 and decided to give it to the kingdom of Swaziland during the reign of King Sopuza II. As chief minister of Kwazulu, I took them to the high court and I won the case. The government took it to the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein, and we again won. And it was the government that lost the case in 1982. The reason, my compatriots, that the court judged in our favor was that the sovereign government had no right to take any piece of land in Wazulu without consulting us. It was on that basis. Now, against this background, it is absurd in the extreme that two panels now have recommended that the Ngonyama Trust land must be amended or repealed. I piloted that act as it was passed by the Wazulu Legislative Assembly. After 1994, when some people in the ANC were literally paying for my blood, they took the law to the democratic government in Cape Town, where it was thoroughly debated, amended, and retained. That was more than two decades ago. Now, whenever land is discussed, we look back to 1913, because it was in 1913 that the sovereign government passed the Native Land Act, when they decided to hoard 87% of South Africa for themselves and a lot just 13 percent to the majority of the population, black people of this country. Shortly before the infamous act, in January 1912, a young lawyer from Inanda by the name of Dr. Pixley, Kai Sakaseme, entered the scene. He had qualified in both the United States and Great Britain. Dr. Sema invited African leaders to Bloemfontein where he and they founded the African National Native Congress, which would be later be the African National Congress. Dr. Sema, of course, was married to my aunt, Her Royal Highness Princess Pigisile Harriet Katinizul, actually King Dinizul's firstborn. When I was doing my trick in 1947, is anyone who was doing my trick in 1947? <laughs> <laughs> I used to be invited to Dr. Sam's residence. He would then ask me to do some errands for him. This is the founder of the ANC. He would dictate letters to various people, which I wrote in longhand, and he would sign them. 
So the issue of land has been central to our struggle for liberation. Of course, some people, younger people like Mr. Kualu are rude. Always laugh when I come to that part because of my bad handwriting. Because I always say that I learned many things in school and many things at the university, but they failed to teach me how to write. <laughs> In April 1994, all of you are aware we achieved our political emancipation, but the land was still in the hands of the white minority. That is why, as a party, we support the expropriation of land with some compensation, as enshrined in our country's constitution. While the present government's program of restoring land to our people has been so slow in the last 25 years, it is surprising that they should be salivating now for the Ngonyama Trust Land, which are the bits and pieces under the king administered by him and his Amakosi in accordance with indigenous and customary law. The only reason why I did that is because I, I understood quite perfectly, I understood perfectly that our constitution recognized the institution of traditional leadership the existence of Amakosi. So I knew then that if that was the case, then it would continue to be administered through indigenous and customary law. So on the long, difficult road we traveled, when there was hardly any mobilization for our country, I happened to be invited with Mr. Oliver Tambo in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia in 1974 to debate then the, the very burning issue of that time. That was the ANC's strategy of imposing economic sanctions and disinvestment on South Africa. After almost of our all night debate with Mr. Tambo on the issue at the Hilton Hotel in Kenya, in Nairobi, Mr. Tambo decided not to proceed to Addis Ababa, where the debate was taking place. As my leader, Mr. Tambo recommended that I should proceed to Ethiopia to participate in the debate on the imposition of sanctions and disinvestment. He said that it would look bad if both of us went to Ethiopia to give different views as both of us were leaders from South Africa. I did as my leader said. I went to Addis. Then on my return, to Nairobi, where there was a celebration of Kenya's independence. I rejoined Mr. Tambo. We participated in the celebration of Kenya independence. I then decided that I would go to Lusaka, where in, in the same plane with Mr. Tambo, that I was going to go to Zambia and Dar es Salaam. In, in, in Lusaka, in Zambia, I was going to see President Kaunda and President Nyerere in Tanzania to thank them for giving sanctuary to all our political exiles of all parties. So while I was in Lusaga, President Kaunda sent me to visit the office of his party, UNIP, That's the following day, after he hosted dinner for me and my wife and my minister who accompanied me, he asked me, after visiting the UNIP office to come to the State House, where I found all the senior leaders of UNIP. Dr. Kaunda told me that after Sharpville, he and others leaders of the frontline states appreciated very much that there was hardly any voice in South Africa. I'd become the only voice speaking about the liberation of our country. I'm glad that they, and all journalists. I'm glad that there's a journalist who is not so young, Mr. Arthur Kony Kramer, who can testify to that. They even awarded me the South African Journalist, what do you call, award by all the journalists. You know, there were journalists some time back who used to behave better than you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, what I was doing, what I was doing, he said, Kaunda said, what you are doing anyway is not good enough. Oh, I was surprised. 
the recounter said that when I returned to South Africa, that I should found a membership-based organization in order to reignite political mobilization in South Africa. I consulted Mr. Tambo as my leader, and he agreed that I should go ahead. I then consulted Bishop Alfio Zulu, who advised me to lean towards culture to avoid this organization suffering the same fate as our other political movements that were banned. Thus, on his advice, on Bishop Zulu's advice, I founded the National Cultural Liberation Movement in Kata and Kulegwe on the 21st of March 1975 at Guanzimela. This history has been hidden and misrepresented for years. But this year, on the 21st of February, I visited the first president of Zambia, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda. This year, 2019, after being received by His Excellency, Mr. Edgar Chagualung, the president of Zambia, I then visited him at his home. During my visit in February to Dr. Kaunda, he made a statement that confirms the truth of all I've said. I wish to read the, read the statement now so that it may become part of, of history. Bob, I want you now to mind. I'm going to find your statement, Mr. Cowan. Prince Mangosuto Butelezi, President of Inkata Freedom Party, and my dear brother, welcome to my humble home and to Zambia. Prince Butelezi, we first met in 1974 here in Lusaka when I was a leader of a young independent nation of Zambia and was honored to be leader of the frontline states which were all newly independent states. We hosted South African political exiles and freedom fighters, hosting political exiles and freedom fighters was a huge risk to our own freedom as a nation. Finally, we could not afford this task since Ian Smith had closed the borders for us to transport goods through Rhodesia. The security risk was enormous on our people as the apartheid regime in South Africa was becoming more and more vicious. But we had to do that historic duty for the freedom of black people. I am very proud, I am a very proud man. We did this and all God's children in South Africa, black and white, yellow, etc., are free today as God's children. Your visit to Zambia for Nuala and to me to thank us for the role we played in that struggle is indeed very significant. When you, as a youthful Zulu prince, visited us in Zambia, I understood very well the risk you were taking onto your shoulders. As the 1970s progressed, it was becoming clearer to all of us in the frontline states that the apartheid regime was growing more and more vicious and oppressive to the black people. The outcome of their viciousness was more and more of the young people freeing the country to fight for freedom. The physical and social conditions for young people like you became unbearable and unacceptable. Clearly, the conditions in apartheid South Africa made the struggle for liberation waged from outside the country necessary. But at the same time, this was not completely ideal because it made the internal mobilization and organization of your oppressed masses difficult. We were facing a real 
difficult situation and ordinary people in that country were beginning to lose hope in the struggle. This is the, challenging, the challenge the African National Congress in which you were a prominent member was faced with. We therefore decided to come up with other means of mobilizing the masses in South, South Africa. It was then that we agreed to instruct you to form a mass-based organization from within because a dangerous vacuum was developing in that country. I and other leaders of the frontline states, together with Comrade Oliver Tambo of the ANC, were convinced that you should take up a new role in the organization. You were most suited for this job because you came from the Zulu royal family. When you visited in 1994, you were encouraged to go back to South Africa, to apartheid South Africa, and form a membership-based organization since the African National Congress was by this time a banned political organization and that most of its leaders, including Comrade Nelson Mandela, had been put in prison. You shouldered the responsibility and advanced the struggle for liberation by cultural means during that critical period of our time. Let me thank you for taking up the, historic, the historical instruction and task with such dedication and honor. I know there were difficult days in the struggle, especially in the 1980s, when brother turned against brother resulting in unfortunate violence and death among black people. It is during that period that you showed your unwavering courage and commitment to the cause of liberation. I am today a very proud man that freedom came to South Africa in our lifetime. Thank you once again, Prince Mangosutu, for the cause you took with such dedication. I am gratified that you have continued to do so this day. Your role in the struggle is never in doubt. Even Matiba recognized and honored you by making you his Minister of Home Affairs and asked you to act as President in his place. My brother, you honored me last year by inviting me to come to Guazulu Natal to celebrate with you your 90th birthday. I was excited and humbled to come myself, but I sent, I sent my eldest son, Panji Kaunda, and Ambassador George Kanyamula Zulu, one of your own tribesmen here in Zambia, to represent me. Thank you for receiving them with much love. May you enjoy your visit to Zambia and enjoy the Nwala ceremony of the Ngoni people, a ceremony that links the Ngonis of Zambia to the Zulu Kingdom in South Africa. May God, our Creator, bless you with many more years ahead. I thank you, Father, for, for that because I, it, it would make me blush you know, to, if I was reading it myself. <laughs> Inkata and Kulewe Caesar worked very closely with the ANC's mission in exile. We continue to communicate with Mr. Tambo through emissaries. And he and I, and I met in many places. I remember we met in Mangoche, in Malawi, we met in, in Lagos, in, 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 in Nigeria, 
We met him in Sweden and many other places. Then, in October 1979, at Mr. Tambo's own request, he and I met in London with delegations of the ANC and Inkart. We talked for two and a half days at a hotel at the airport called Excelsior Hotel. Mr. Tambo put two issues to us. He wanted Inkata to endorse the policy of imposing economic sanctions and disinvestment on South Africa. Secondly, he wanted us to endorse the armed struggle. I must say that we had a very cordial discussion, but we as Inkata could not agree to endorse those two policies which Mr. Tambo recommended to us. Instead, I recommended what I call a multi-strategy approach, and what I call a composite approach, for each organization to do what it was doing, and to accept that it would be the cumulative effect of all of our efforts that would ultimately make Kuku crumble, as the Americans would say. On the issue of imposing economic sanctions and disinvestment, I held huge rallies in the townships in Devon, in Soweto, in Langa, in Bloemfontein, in Kronstadt, in Welcom, and many other places. And each time I put this to African people, people responded by saying that if that was done, they would starve to death without jobs, if that policy was followed. As far as the armed struggle is concerned, I remembered my two-hour discussion with President Nyerere in 1974, when he said to me that there was not a single defense force in Africa. <coughs> and he forgot that I didn't understand, so he said, Akoni! And then he apologized. He said that he has forgotten that I am doing so he asked. He said he meant absolutely. He said, not a single defense force in Africa, nor even a combination of forces that could take on the South African Defense Force. I still appreciate it. Let me make it very clear that the post strategies of the ANC would make a contribution to our liberation. For example, the threat of violence I felt was contributing to our liberation. But Inkara could not abandon the principle of non-violence, which the founding father, my uncle Dr. Seme, and founding fathers, you know, actually laid down as the foundation of the African Nation Congress in Plumfant in 1912. Nor could we go against the people that had addressed in thousands and do what they, they didn't want. In the end, Inkata and the ANC agreed to meet again a few weeks later, after the meeting of the ANC in December. Sadly, sadly, National Chair, that never happened. Instead, Mr. Tambo immediately issued a statement denying that the meeting ever took place. This had never took place. You know that there was one journalist who later became a member of his party, Su Suzanne Voss. She was then the chief of the Bureau of Sunday Times in London. And she splashed you know, a little story in the Sunday Times that the A and the ANC have met in London. You know? And then Mr. Tambo got, then issued a statement and said it was not true that it never happened. And a few months later, in June 1980, the Secretary General of the ANC, Mr. Alfred Nzo, issued a scathing attack on me. After that, I might say, the sluice gates were opened, and the ANC waged an international campaign of verification against me and in God. 
Then they later imposed what they call a people's war in South Africa, which resulted in the very ugly and painful black-on-black -black violence. With this long history behind us, my fellow compatriots, I feel that an era is drawing to a close. I'm deeply grateful that I can close this chapter with my mind at peace. As I pass the baton to the new president of the IFP, I'm able to say with pride, mission accomplished. I can say with a clear conscience that I complied with the instructions of my leaders, in course Albert Lutuli and Mr. Oliver Tambo, to ensure that the bits and pieces, the so-called Ngonyama Trust Land, the bits on which the king and Amakos are perched, never became a Bantustan, like the TBV systems. We never became a Bantustan. We resisted being made foreigners in South Africa. In fact, there was an Iguazulu certificate of citizenship, you know, in courts. And many of our people from the Eastern Cape, even from Botswana, would approach us to give them this Iguazulu citizenship in order for them to get passports. Because they, they, these broke us passports from the Abu Dhabi, which, which were not accepted internationally. So by rejecting independence a la Pretoria, I prevented the apartheid regime from stripping all of us, I mean all black people of South Africa, of their sovereign citizenship. I protected all black people from being foreigners in their own country. Yeah. At the same time, this is a fact of history, my fellow compatriots, that I managed to bring together in this province, the people of this province, of all races, through the Vitalese Commission, which was chaired by the Deputy Chancellor of the University of Natal, it was in marriage back. And it was with Natal Indau. Before 94, Listen carefully, before 94, long before 94, we created the Guazulu Natal Legislative Authority, which was the first non-racial government in South Africa. By 94, Guazulu didn't govern by itself. We governed together with, 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 with Natal, with whites and Indians and, and colors together. The first, it's, it's conveniently swept under the carpet, of course, and, and some, hip, some of the dishonest opponents of ours always say, we tell us it was a bunch of stand leader. I was never a bunch of stand leader. This part of the country called was will never kill a bunch of stand. I thank the people who made it possible across all races in this province. I particularly wish to pay a special tribute to those who have passed away. Beyond this, I must Thank President de Klerk for heeding my plea to release Mandela and other political prisoners so that we could finalize the liberation of this country without further loss of human life. I pay tribute to President Nelson Mandela, my friend and fellow freedom fighter, and to other leaders across all political parties, such as Robert Mangalisa Sobugwe, Steve Biko, several martyrs of our struggle, who are too numerous to name here. I pay my respects to the great patriots who led our black resistance, our traditional leaders, such as King Kejoyo Gampande, here Lapondin, King Skukuni of the Pedis, Makoma in the Eastern Cape, kings of other nations, who with their people paid with their lives for our freedom. I thank President Kaunda, President Nyerere, and other frontline state presidents, and presidents of many African countries who hosted so many 
of our political exiles of all parties in their countries. I thank the many in the inter international community who contributed so much to our titanic struggle to liberate South Africa, the last country in Africa to be liberated. I'm left with only one regret. What was done to me by one of my leaders, Mr. Oliver Tambo, opened a wound that is not yet healed. After our chief liberation in 1994, we worked together with the ANC in the Government of National Unity. In this province, we had a coalition government with the ANC. I was Minister of Home Affairs under both the leadership of President Mandela and President Mbegi. Over the years, many efforts were made to bring about reconciliation, to consolidate the reconciliation between the two organizations. But this has never been fully achieved. It is something that must be achieved. It must be achieved. It's a challenge to normalize the political relationship between our organizations. This, members of the IFP, now lies in the future. It's your challenge. My greatest sadness is that I won't get to see the next chapter of the IFP. I won't be amongst the men and women who cross into the promised land of social and economic justice, having endured the struggle ahead. This is not because I'm stepping down, but because in a few days' time, next week, I'll be 91 years. And, and common sense tells me that my time is short. There's so much I'll not get to see. I have a consolation though. You will get to see it. You will get to see it. I cannot tell you how privileged I feel to have worked alongside so many extraordinary patriots amongst you. It will be impossible for me to recount the names of those who have walked this journey with me and have distinguished themselves as leaders. I can only thank God Almighty. Baba, Mbonganina, Abafundis, Mama Sonde, Mama Shela Mani, Navagicha Sheshi, No Sister, Nishula Melmothi, O Sister Peshe, Chalmane, Nagupi. I thank God for his infinite wisdom for being together so many remarkable people. I must thank you, uh, say thank to you leaders of our party who are present here today. You have been chosen by history to take the IFP into a new season. But I know that you know that there are many more who came before you, whose dedication and sacrifice brought us to this point. I'm humbled to have served South Africa hand in hand with them and with you. May our future leaders carry, carry the, that legacy with pride. It's however not only our leaders that I must thank. I owe a debt of gratitude to the rank and file of IFP members, you my comrades, for the faith for the faithful who have voted for us since 1994, and to those who have tied their destiny to the destiny of the IFP. Whilst I've only joined the IFP recently, many have grown up in, the, in this party. I'm proud when I see people wearing IFP regalia, although I must say I'm hurt when they distort our regalia, for instance, if you wear, wear, like wearing red barrettes, to confuse us as the EF and then put our, our <laughs> logo on, on red barrettes and so on. I'm proud when total strangers, not only in this country, but from even from other countries, write to me thanking the IFP for what it's doing in South Africa. And I'm proud to know that the IFP has been a good home for so many struggling South Africans, you, my comrades. Because we haven't just demanded political allegiance, we have substantially changed the lives of countless individuals, I'm proud to say. I remember that in this part, again, there was a division between me and my leaders in the ANC, because I was still a member of the ANC in the 70s. When the ANC 
came out with the slogan, liberation, education later. You see, after young people rose in Soweto, that uprising, I think that they felt that they were being bypassed now by the young people. So they came with a slogan that people should not go to school, there should be no education. In fact, people should burn down schools that they have because they are inferior to the schools of the white people or that of the Indian people or the colored people. I said to myself, if I don't need my head red, if I only have a vest full of, of holes and nothing else, can I, can I bend it when I have nothing else to wear? I said, education for liberation. We build, we build teachers all over the country. We build teacher training colleges. We created industrial estates and brought investors in this province to create jobs in various parts of our province. We built houses for our people in all townships, decent houses. <laughs> Even though of all the homeland governments, we received a shoestring budget from Pretoria that on a per capita basis. Less was budgeted for, by Pretoria for the education in Wazulu than anywhere else. We, on the basis of our belief in self-help and self-reliance, created a rent-for-rent -rent basis. I appeal to Amakosi. Oi, sema Amakosi, la akona lapa. Nikosi, sema shaizim. Nikosi, ya washabisa, nama ya Amakosi. Mara si isi gingu. Asika laba andu wa kipi rent. Besi kutulu balana. Awa sinika alu anastangani isi. We did wonders with that on the basis of our belief in self-help and self-reliance. I wish in this connection to thank His Majesty the King and Amakosi who responded to my message of self-help and self-reliance. I must also thank the late head of the Divine Life Society, Somiji, His Holiness, Sahaja Nanda, who assisted us with, huge, with the huge job of building so many schools and so many other facilities for our black people. I also thank the Natal Education Committee, which was led by my late friend and former classmate, Professor Fatima Mia. I also equally thank the local brothers for their contribution. We as Inkata stopped multinational companies from packing up and leaving South Africa taking dozens of jobs away. I actually went overseas. I went and saw the Mercedes people, I went to, you know, BMW people, Siemens, all the companies. I went there myself to plead with them, not to accept what the ANC was saying, because our people would suffer. I traveled all over the world, and I met heads of state, such as American President Jimmy Carter, President Reagan, President Bush, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, Chancellor Helmut Kohl in Germany, Mr. Daniel Owl in the Netherlands, asking them not to endorse the policy of the ANC of withdrawing multinational companies from South Africa, which would have resulted in more job losses <laughs> for people had I not done what I did. The foundation, young people, of this joblessness which has destroyed economic growth in this country, was the result of these economic sanctions and the disinvestment campaign. You know, I remember having a church with our former president, President Zuma, because the government of South Africa and the ANC did not support economic sanctions imposed on, on Ms. Mugabe. So I said to him, Sholos, I hear you don't support sanctions against Mugabe. He said, yes, because our people would suffer. I said, I'm sure those. It's just for this you vilified me when I said so in South Africa. Of course, you know, I'm sure a, a big weapon of laughing. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> we sent women to, to be trained in community leadership. 
in Canada, we prevented an all-out war in South Africa. We should have reduced our country to ashes. I'm sorry, although I've taken so much time, and I'm still going to take more time. <laughs> because I said this was not a speech. So the journalist must not say it is a so many pages speech. Because it's just like a, a mad journalist who, when I was giving a report wrapping up the government of Wazulu, then sent it to the Guinness and said that I've broken the record of the world by giving the longest speech. <laughs> Let me share a conversation I had one with one brother, a black American. He says to me in the evening, he says, but surely you come from Zulu people, warrior people, yes. Why don't you support why don't you support the you know the arms struggle there for you? We come from the warrior people. So I said, exactly, you're right. It's exactly because I come from a warrior people that I don't do it. Because I know that my, my ancestors, my, my forebears, from, which I, from whom I come, which was when they were less cattle, then they would, they would campaign to, to attack people in order to bring cattle and beautiful women, you see, to marry. I said, if there was a war in, a war in South Africa, we'd only inherit ashes. We secured the creation of provinces, which the ruling party didn't want, which puts a check on a centralized government, although one a federal state, but still even the imitation, the poor imitation of a federal state that we have in South Africa was actually brought up by the IFP. We place a bill of rights in our democratic constitution to ensure that a government of the majority respects individual and group rights. We prioritize education, as I've already said, while everywhere schools were being burned to the ground. Dr. Motana was a contemporary of mine at the University of Port Hale, who was a member of the Committee of Ten in Soweto had to appeal me because education in Soweto stopped completely. And also Mr. Pesci Kobozo, who was the editor of the, the paper that was banned by the regime, the world, they appealed to me to make a place for them at Kwajangaiso High School for their children to be educated there because there was no education in Soweto. We delivered anti rifle virus to address mother-to-child transmission of HIV and AIDS. We joined Ms. Achmott, Achmott and his NGO in a court, Supreme Court case in which they were asking the court to force the ANC government to supply nivirapine to pregnant mothers. We instructed the, our premier, Dr. Lionel Mujal, to go to court to join Achmott and the NGO to prove that the IFP-led government, which was an IFP government, was already supplying nevarapine since the ANC in this province were opposing that this be done by saying that it is impossible to do it. So we wanted to give evidence that we were already doing it. In fact, the then Minister of Health, I think it was Dr. Mkese, he even went to court to sue Dr. Mchali. He said, although he's Premier, he has the, you know, the authority as Minister of Health to deal with that matter. The Supreme Court ruled that all the final authority in the province resides in the Premier. <laughs> we stood up to oppressors and secured a seat for everyone around the negotiating table. Behind every one of these victories is a story I could tell you today. These are the stories of the IFIS legacy. Why do I tell them? They are the stories of the IFIS legacy. And they must be told. It is vital the future generations remember the battles and victories of the past. These are the things that encourage us, reminding us that what seems utterly impossible can in fact be done. This is why I've called on our youth brigade and our women's brigade to reignite political education ensuring that at branch level, at branch level, 
we convey to our members the real story of the IFP. It is this that grows cohesion. It is this that grows commitment. In the early years of Inkata, long before WhatsApp groups and Facebook, Facebook people used to gather. Before there was Facebook, we had branch meetings and talk about the issues of the day in branch meetings. At grassroots level, people made the time and created the space to listen and participate. But let me not be misunderstood. I, I admit that there is tremendous value in posting your tweet about our country and in following a news feed. But there is still something unique, good people, in people physically engaging with one another at a meeting, in a face-to-face -face conversation. It is there that ideas are sparked, consensus is reached, and collaboration develops. I have therefore emphasized the value of going back to grassroots activism, getting people into one venue and sharing information. We are blessed to have the benefit of technology to arrange these things and to convey messages quickly and widely, yes. But let's not substitute a Facebook post for an afternoon meeting of collaborative debate. We must use technology, yes, to further our cause not allow it to dictate the strength or length of our message. Would it have been the same if we sent out an SMS asking you to vote online for our next leaders? Of course not. It is, it is important to come together, to have your say, to listen to one another, to consider ideas and just arguments. This, that is what democracy is all about. Every one of you in this venue has been chosen by your structures to represent their voice. We are here to carry the mandate of your structure into the decisions of the party. And the collective decisions we will take today are far-reaching indeed. They need to be far-reaching. During this conference, you will choose a new president, a deputy president, a national chairperson, a deputy national chairperson, a Secretary General, a Deputy Secretary General, as well as 34 committee members who will serve our National Council. This, in terms of our Constitution, is done through an elective National Conference, this conference, to ensure that democratic will of the people is done and seen to be done. I think we can be proud of the fact that our extended National Council, several of them have put forward one candidate to stand for the election as party president. It was a unanimous decision. All the structures of the party were there. For years, our detractors have tried to create the impression that there's a big storm raging in the IFP over who will be the next president. It turns out that that storm was nothing more than a teacup, a storm in a teacup. Now, there's far greater unity within the IFP than our opponents are willing to acknowledge. I realize, of course, that conference is well within its rights to nominate a second, third, or fourth candidate or fifth to stand for election. But I'm impressed by the degree of unity that is demonstrated and expressed as we're engaged in several extended national country meeting leading us to this conference. My prayer is that we leave this weekend having proven our opponents wrong. With us corporates. Because they are wrong to think that the IFP has reached the end of, of the road. This is just the beginning. They are wrong to think that the IFP will not survive. We have been restored as official opposition in this province through a national election. They are wrong to think that we are divided internally beyond repair. The IFP is moving and speaking as one. And they are also wrong to think that Mahmoud Sultan is clinging to power. That particular accusation has hurt me tremendously. It has impacted on my family who are here. 
Because clearly, the longer I was asked to remain at the helm, the less time I had left to spend my, with my children and my beloved wife. It was not my own decision to remain as party president for so many years. But I'm a Democrat. When my party unanimously asked me to lead, I accepted. There was always a reason behind the request. And I feel as hard as it was that we made the right decisions. We needed to reach this point ready and able. For the sake of the IFP and for the sake of our country, we had to properly prepare the way for this moment. Let me speak for a moment about my family. For they have given me the greatest gift through their support. My heart bleeds for time. I cannot regain with my late wife, Mjungulu Irene Mamzila. I cannot imagine a better helpmeet in the journey of service that I walked. She was a rock to me and a mother to many in the IFP. She loved and served the party with vigor, compassion, and commitment. She believed in what we were doing and she was deeply involved. It is to my wife and to my mother, Princess Makoko Katinizulu, that I owe so much. In a very real sense, they were my man mentors. As much as my uncle, Dr. Pixley, Kai Sarasame, was my mentor. As much as Inkos Albert Tutuli was my mentor. As much as Bishop Alfios Zulu was my mentor. As much as Professor Zachariah Kiri Rolling Matthews was my mentor. Dr. Sarasame imbued me with politics at a young age. I was only 18 years. Inkos Albert Zulu imparted seven leadership in me. Bishop Zulu was a key figure in the founding of this organization. But Princess Makoko, what in Zulu, taught me. My father died when I was 14 years. And she taught me strength and courage. And taught me and instilled in me the fear of God. And Irene, my wife, taught me compassion. When I look back, it is clear to me that mentorship played a very pivotal role in developing both my character and my beliefs. It worries me that so many young people today are growing without mentors. Our youth face extraordinary hardship. Unemployment has already reached 29%, but among the youth, it has reached 52%. Millions of able-bodied young people are sitting at home without work and without an income. In many cases, the education system has failed them. And they've left school without being equipped to enter the labor force. But for many others, this is simply a case of there being no jobs available. There are university graduates, even in this tent, with marketable skills and a high level of training who are still unemployed. It is not just education system that has failed our youth. The economy, can I repeat? It is not just the education system that has failed us. The economy has failed them as well. When South Africa entered democracy in 1994, we inherited a strong economy. But we also faced, you know, for the first time, with the constitutional requirement of meeting everyone's needs with the resources that were available. It was no longer a case of resources being used for some and denied to others. In those first years, democracy, when I served as President Mandela's cabinet minister of home affairs, I warned my colleagues in the cabinet, in the government of national unity, again and again, that we needed to focus on growing the economy. Regardless of how we sliced the economy pie, there was not enough to feed everyone. It wasn't just about rearranging the columns, but about growing the fundamental base, our economy. This call for strong economic growth is part of the IFP's legacy. Just as we petitioned for federalism and the devolution of powers, we petitioned at the negotiating table for a free market economy where business could flourish, jobs could be created, and investment could be secured. 
Today, economists can trace back the history of economic collapse and pinpoint the problem. The ruling party never committed to one economic policy. Never committed to one economic policy. Instead, they allowed their tripartite partners, the South African Communist Party and the Congress of Trade Unions to dictate policies that were neither fish nor fowl. You know when Mr. Mpegi went was under his cabinet, when Mr. Mpegi brought in his economic policy of growth, um, gear, growth, there's an ac acronym actually of growth, um, they just were getting. But when he did that, I went to the podium in, in, in Parliament and I compared what he was seeing to Saul when Saul went to Damascus. Thus, government leaders who speak about creating, because what happened? He introduced it. Even the very following weekend, on our screens, we saw members of the Communist Party and Kosati saying, Was he fool here? Was he fool here? <laughs> Thus, the government leaders who speak about creating a developmental state in this country, while systematically entrenching a welfare state. 17 million are depending on social grants in our country. And even our President Mshorozi admitted it cannot be sustained. We adopted gear and then abandoned gear when they did that because of the votes which they get from them. We adopted the National Development Plan, which would have been a great legacy of Mrs. Zuma. And then the partners again criticized it and quietly stopped implementing it. The schizophrenic approach to economic policy, listen to me, the schizophrenic approach to, to economic policy has destroyed investor confidence in our, in our country. No wonder South Africa is constantly under threat of receiving junk status. No wonder the Director General of the Treasury, Ms. Mukajani, a few weeks ago, warned about the bailouts, that the coffers of the Treasury are empty, and you might need to start borrowing from multinational institutions like the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, like BRICS, Bank, or International Man Monetary Fund. But still, government office bailouts of, of failing state owned enterprises, despite the IFP warning, even years ago, while I was still in cabinet, that we cannot keep pouring money into a bottomless pit. I even quoted my friend, Mrs. Thatcher, because I remember that she slapped down Skagil of the trade union in, in Britain, and, and she, she sold the, the, the state enterprise. And the economy of Britain blossomed. A fundamental policy decision then needs to be taken. But the ruling party failed to take it so far. And now the economy is failing. That's the challenge we're facing. The effects of this are felt most keenly by ordinary South Africans, yourselves, me and yourselves. How many of you can make ends meet? Are all bills paid every month? Do you ever have to wonder how you'll pay the school fees? Or the rent? Or how you'll buy electricity or put food on the table? These are daily worries to most South Africans. Ours is one of the most unequal societies in the world. No wonder there is constant anxiety, anger, and fear eating away at our nation. This has led to social fragmentation and social ills 
that we never dream possible. Can you imagine a society in which men kill their wives and girlfriends and even their own children? Can you imagine that? A society in which it's so common that it doesn't even make the papers anymore. There's something fundamentally broken in our society. And I'm not saying that it is all because of the economy. But the fact is that people are being stripped of their dignity and their sense of justice inevitably compounds a breakdown of morality. Violence against women and children has become one of the monsters that keeps me up at night. Our country faces many problems, and when I think about them, I cannot help but lose sleep. <coughs> How can I rest? How can anyone rest when there's so much suffering in our country? I've therefore given a great deal of thought to the, my, to the final mandate. I would like to issue, as the president of the IFP, my final mandate. I've told you to reignite grassroots activism and to strengthen our branches. I've encouraged you to learn about the victories of the past. I've asked you to become active participants in promoting democratic ideals. I've asked you to build and not destroy. My final mandate is this, protect our women and children. Become the champions of the, of the vulnerable and start speaking about this in every possible forum, from social media to churches to your own kitchen. We need to change our society by shifting the conversation. Here again, it is about democratic ideals. It's about equality, it's about security. It's about freedom, it's about the right to life. If we give up democratic ideals so lightly, South Africa will be lost. I plead with our youth to think carefully about the fiery rhetoric being spewed by some demagogues in our country. Is it really okay to deny anyone their rights? Is it true, as Machiavelli said, that the end justifies the means? I have never believed that. It is why I refuse to take up the armed struggle, because bloodshed and the loss of life was too high a price to pay for political freedom. One force would argue that there is no price too high for political freedom. But believe me, once we have paid a price that was, in fact, too high, you will know it. It is possible to destroy something priceless, to gain what is priceless. But the loss will have tragic consequences. Anyone who understands history will understand why students at tertiary institutions are flocking to parties that promote socialism. S-O-C-I-A-L-I-S-M, socialism. <laughs> when, I, when I see this word, you know, I cringe. In a climate of joblessness and economic distress, people are desperate for hope. Socialist policies, no matter how unworkable and dangerous, they feed hope, you know. That solution can just magically appear. But throughout history, mark my words, nations have been hurt by this false hope of socialism. When I was Minister of Home Affairs, a group of Russian students visited me here in Ulundi. We talked at length about politics and economics. They, wanted, they said to me they wanted nothing to hear about communism and socialism because they said it destroyed their country. The USSR collapsed under these unworkable policies. Venezuela is another example. We have Zimbabwe on our doorstep. This is absolutely the wrong direction for South Africa's economy. I grew up in the ANC. I'm very proud of it, you know. I grew up in the ANC. And like all our comrades, I was enamored uh, with socialism. We believed in it as a young man. I was excited, you know, by the prospect of speaking to the president of Tanzania, President Julius Nyerere, who was the father of African socialism, Ujamaa. 
He was something of a guru for all of us in Africa. I visited him in Tanzania, as I've already told you, to thank him for giving sanctuary to all our exiles. And now I was visiting him again to hear his wisdom on socialism. But I discovered that he had dramatically changed his mind. Experience had shown him the real life consequence of socialism. He gave me a copy of his book entitled 10 Years After Arusha and warned me against following the same path in South Africa. Years later, when we achieved our freedom, he had paid a state visit to South Africa. He requested those who were arranging his itinerary to arrange a, a, you know, an appointment with me in my office in Cape Town. He told me then of what happened in 1980, when he was in Zimbabwe, when President Mugabe was installed as the first Prime Minister of, Zim of a free Zimbabwe. He said, in reference you know, to the economy of Zimbabwe, he said to Mugabe, we have inherited a jewel, don't destroy it. Of course, you know, the rest is history. I, I don't need to comment any further. So, tragically, 25 years in democracy, let me emphasize, especially to our, our houses of, of the media, I'm saying today, tragically, 25 years into democracy, South Africa is still struggling with the ghost of socialism. Some parties are espousing it openly. There are quite a number of them, and others are flirting with it. The ruling party is still beholden to the tripartite partners, the Communist Party and the, and the Kosatu, to the point that it is pursuing land expropriation without compensation, while still believing it can bring investments. Investors won't come when there is no policy certainty and no security of investment. No wonder we have failed to attain that elusive 5% growth. We have not parted company with socialism. The economic crisis is self-inflicted. There is an often quoted saying that you cannot multiply wealth by dividing it, unquote. You cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. This is absolutely true. Let me read and explain you an explanation, not from an economist this time, but from a pastor. The Baptist pastor, Dr. Adrian Rogers, said, and I quote him, he said, you cannot legislate the poor into freedom by leg legislating the wealthy out of freedom. What one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. The government cannot give to anybody anything that the government does not first take from somebody else. When half the population, people, get the idea that they do not have to work because the other half is going to take care of them, and when the other half gets the idea that it does, it does no good to work because somebody else is going to get what they work for, that, my friend, the pastor says, is about the end of any nation." Unquote. Now we know that South Africa, South Africans want to work. We know that South Africans want to work. Our people understand the value of you and the importance of working. The tragedy of unemployment created by a failing economy is doubled by the dependence it creates on government. There is no government, not a government of the ANC, not a government of the EFF, not a government of the DA, not even a government of the IFP can meet every physical need of every citizen. There is no shortcut. There is no shortcut to social and economic justice. It must be structured on democratic ideals through sound democratic policies and fair democratic implementation. It will take hard work 
my fellow compatriots, in a long time. But let me assure you, but it can be done. <laughs> let us be the ones to champion this cause of action. In this new season of struggle, let the IFP hold high the banner of democracy, building on strong legacy that belongs to the IFP. But I must sound one final warning. I must sound one final warning. There is danger on the road ahead. Understand, we are not in a normal situation in South Africa. A recent report, you know, of News 24 said the following, quote, the ANC Youth League in Johannesburg is offering their members military training, gun handling and guerrilla tactics. The AFF, which has vowed to take power if it comes to a confrontation through the barrel of a gun, now boasts a pseudo military wing. Sounds like a normal democracy to you, is it? Little wonder the budget for VIP security escalates year on year into billions of rand. The South Africa's political elite is forced to isolate itself from both the people and its own party members." Unquote. A report on Business Day Live just last month said the following, the next round of local government elections is two years away. And given that political killings, at least so far, define so much local politics, the scene seems set for a bloodshed, bloodbath, and, and no one is taking it seriously. Uncool. Violence is becoming a standard feature of our national discourse. Violence against women and children, violence in politics, violence against foreign nationals, violence against the police, violence in our communities, violence in schools. I had to stop. It has, it has to stop. It has to stop. And I call on our new leadership in the IFP to focus political attention to restoring peace and the rule of law. There can be no social justice where violence exists. I'll keep speaking about these things until my last breath. I've served my country for almost 70 years. It is part of who I am. I won't stop speaking now. And I can never stop serving. Not when they still suffering around me. But my time as president of the IFP is finished. I'm handing the baton to a new leader. I'll support that leader. I'll, I'll support that leader. Uh, with all, with all I can. Uh, forgive me, I think that uh, it's just the last piece of it. Uh, Otter, please. Order, please. <clears throat> Order, please. I I have had my say, and I've written my, my last testament. Mm -hmm. 
Zo, dat I was going to say, lastly, that we need not be shy about the legacy of, of the IFP. In the 70s, President Talbot, William Talbot, of Liberia, the first country to be liberated in Africa, visited Lesotho. When I was in Lesotho, he could hear my footsteps here. He invited me to Liberia, and he awarded me a national order in, in Liberia. He says I was a knight commander of the Star of Africa, which is a national award in that area. There was a professor in Durban by the name of Lawrence Lemmer. His Kramer knows him, was very close to him. You know, African people, in the Industrial Conciliation Act, the word worker did not include Africans. So with Dr. Sle Professor Slemmer, we started a school for industrial workers in Durban and as chancellor of the school. And with my work, amongst the workers, including, for instance, the 1973 strike, when there was a strike in Durban, a very big strike. And with my Minister of Interior, Mrs. Dada, we, we joined workers and helped them. And the Minister of Labor then was Mr. Mare Filiun. Mr. Mare Filiun issued a statement and said that Mutelezi must stop interfering in Durban because it's outside Gosu. I responded. I said that when you created these governments, you said they were for Zulus wherever they are. As a result of all those things, the largest trade union in the democratic world, the AFLCIO in America, awarded me their highest award, the George Meany Human Rights Award. <laughs> and what humbled me, fellow compatriots, is that I was jointly given that together with Dr. Neil Agat. Dr. Neil Agat had a very active trade unionist in Johannesburg and was assassinated also by the about the regime, I was granted that jointly with him. So I really wouldn't talk about other things, but I, I say those things should just be remind us that in spite of all the negative propaganda that we faced throughout my leadership, that in fact, we were living a, we have a print, a footprint in serving the people of South Africa. Well, my time as president of the IFP is finished, as I've said, and I'm handing over the baton this afternoon. When I announced in October 2017 that I would not stand for re-election as president of the party, I said that I would play any role that my party requires of me. If my frailty is not worse than it is now, under the leadership of our new president. I leave it to you as our national conference to decide what role, if any, you'd like me to play. When the extended National Council asked me to lead our election campaign earlier this year, 
I accepted a very onerous burden, despite knowing that it would demand what it would demand of me. I work hand in hand with our premier candidate, Mr. Velengo Sisabisa, to ensure that electorate understood the IFP's core values, our vision, our mission, which have remained unchanged. As we move into a new chapter, I end up by saying that the IFP remains strong. And it is up to you, my comrades in this elective conference, to choose or endorse the leaders who can take us forward with integrity and strength. On the long journey I've traveled, I'm grateful to my comrades, you, my comrades, who have walked parts of that long journey with me. But above all, I'm grateful to God Almighty who guided me through this difficult journey. Niabonga, Riali Bucha, Badanka. If you show me, 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 Kudumleo, <laughs> I think it's a stretch while you walk on the point of view. I think it's a put a ease. Well, Tata is a come about many seven when in twelve was a woman of the African National Congress. Who said that La Pamayo Tahakral, Mafita, about one of my plus, who said my Abakutas, Baba Tang, and Mrs. Kat. Now, when a plaza is a crown, Ubabu said, Moba Umsabas won't go away. Got on Kamala, but I'm a Mabuti, even Jalabas put the eyes open. But I keep up Mutato Wooti, Mum Cosso, which you will get a muzzle, Mum Zul, which will get a Betuan, Mum Tuan, which will get a suit, Mum Ped, which will get a Wabai, but I spend all good men with salt. But that I eat good one, eat good. About the salary is ten percent. But 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 she, as be a major. Does it go to a large group of people? Well, thank you very much. A very warm welcome to our viewers. We are coming to you live from Ulundi Stadium. This is where the uh, leader, or the outgoing leader of the IFP. Tenez has just finished addressing these thousands of delegates who are attending this conference. At the moment, he's on the podium, but is only delivering the Izulu version of his speech. But maybe just to highlight some of the things that he said in his speech, he started by telling the delegates that I rise today not to deliver the usual speech, but to close an era and to do that properly. I'm obliged to speak on the history of our liberation struggle. The leader. All right. The leader of the IFP then uh, went on to uh, uh, talk about quite a number of challenges that are facing the party. The issue of uh, disunity, saying that he's happy that at the moment the party has been able to actually address issues of disunity. He's happy that the party has gone a long way towards addressing some of the challenges that are, that are facing South Africans. He also spoke at length about his history now, uh, having formed the, uh, the IFP in 1975, saying that 
he formed the party uh, in 1975 and he, he was very uh, eager and determined to play a meaningful role towards uplifting the lives of uh, millions of South Africans and he says as he sits here today as he prepares to hand over the baton to the new incoming leadership he is very confident and is very happy with the current state of the IFP. He also spoke about the issue of the land saying that uh, the, is referring to the 1913 Land Act how uh, black people in this country lost the land but also uh, emphasizing that as the IFP they do not support land expropriation without compensation. They are for land expropriation with compensation saying that will be uh, uh, the policy of the IFP uh, saying that uh, a land expropriation without compensation will actually not go anywhere towards uh, addressing the issues facing the country. He also spoke at length also about the achievements of the party saying that the party has been uh, in recent uh, uh, years been able to actually address the issue of uh, youth unemployment saying that when the party was in government in here in KwaZulu Natal they were able to build quite a number of schools and they were also able to play a meaningful role towards ensuring that millions of South Africans do have access to HIV and AIDS uh, treatment in this country, saying, uh, emphasizing the role that the IFP has played in that regard. He also uh, paid tribute to former President Nelson Mandela, saying that uh, 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 he has played, he played a meaningful role as well in his life. Uh, he could not obviously finish the speech without referring or paying tribute to his late wife, Princess Irene Mamzi Labtelezi, who passed on uh, last year, early that last year, or early this year, he actually said that he is the person he is today because of people like uh, Princess Irene Mamze Labtelez having contributed significantly to his life. It's been 44 years since Prince Mangosu Tutelez has been at the helm of the IFP. This party that he is officially uh, 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 saying that he's uh, uh, leaving behind now in terms of his, uh, him being the president, he's saying that the party is in a good state and is quite confident that the incoming leadership that will be elected at this conference will be able to take the, the party forward to take the, 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 the resolutions of the party, to, Im to implement the resolutions of the party, that will then be able to change the lives of millions of South Africans. I can certainly tell you that uh, those people who you see in front of you, uh, uh, the top leadership of the IFP, have been saying throughout the week, uh, having spoken to them, saying that uh, this is uh, actually a good day for them, but it's also a sad uh, occasion because you don't get uh, uh, leaders such as Butelezi very often in a lifetime. So they are saying that his role in building the IFP has been immense and he will continue playing uh, uh, an advisory role to the leadership. Whatever role that they want him to play, he has availed himself to say, I'm still committed to actually assist this party. But as the president now, I'm stepping down. I will then uh, allow uh, those who will be uh, elected to take this party forward. I can uh, throw back to you in Johannesburg for now and say that uh, we will continue, obviously, to bring you more reaction from the ground, what the, uh, some of the delegates here are saying about the speech of Ubaba Inkosumangosu to Tedezi. It's back to you in studio for now. All right, so Simpiwe Makanya, they are a reporter in uh, KZN at uh, that elective conference in Eludin KZN, the IFP's uh, elective conference. Uh,